on today's episode, I'm going to be talking about Peter Pan Syndrome and Wendy Syndrome. It is indeed a most fascinating archetype and one that really can help explain the narcissistic epidemic. How, how more and more people are refusing to grow up and become self-sufficient, functioning adults. The term Peter Pan syndrome is a pop psychology term that has gained a lot of popularity over the years. And it's not hard to see why, because the story itself, this narrative is so rich and so in depth when it comes to describing narcissism. Even though I'm not a psychologist or a professional in this field, I think I can add something of value to this debate, or at least a different perspective. I took the time to watch several different plays online, and there's slight variations to the story, but there's an overall outline or overall theme that we can see through the different movies and the different plays. But let's take a closer look at some of the major parts we see throughout these different plays. Like in the beginning of the story, Peter Pan is trying to catch his shadow. And his shadow runs into this Victorian house where Wendy and her brothers live. So Peter Pan, right from the beginning, is trying to catch his shadow. He is fighting with his shadow. That's a pretty rich metaphor for narcissists argue with themselves. They're in conflict with themselves. And they often drag others into that conflict. One can see this behavior with a lot of drunks, for example. Have you ever watched an alcoholic or a drunk sit on the couch, get heavily intoxicated, and bring up the same arguments and the same topics over and over again as if they're playing a record or a CD of their personal woes. And do you see how they get very angry? And then they try to drag other people into their argument that they're having with themselves. So in the beginning of the story, Peter Pan is fighting with his shadow. And then he meets Wendy and her brothers. Now Wendy has very poor self-esteem. And when Peter Pan offers her to come with him back to Never Never Land so she can look after his friends. But a group of males who do not want to grow up, Wendy is overjoyed. That is an extreme form of codependency. And also, whatever happened to that saying, stranger danger? Isn't Peter Pan thought through the use of magic? He convinced Wendy and her brothers to leave their home without telling anybody else to go to a land that they have never seen. Never, never land. Is this not a form of narcissistic isolation? Is Peter Pan not isolating his victims. He clearly is. He's bringing them to his world and forcing his view of the world onto others. He's projecting his internal reality onto others. And he's manipulating other people's 
perceptions and redirecting them to his own. But think, think more about this. They're flying to Never Never Land. And Peter Pan fails to mention there's a civil war going on on the island between the Lost Boys, the Pirates, and the First Nations people. Peter Pan willfully, I, I think, decided not to mention that fact. But also look at Peter Pan's friends, the Lost Boys. They're living in trees. They refuse to grow up. They're wearing Halloween costumes. And they have this group handshake where they spit on their hands and they, and they do this group handshake. Isn't this making them so socially awkward that they could never leave the island, even if they wanted to? How on earth would these lost boys find employment in the real world? I mean, all they know is wearing Halloween costumes and having these strange group handshakes. How can these individuals even function or prosper in normal society? So Peter Pan has subjected these individuals to infantization. But also look at the military-like control he has over them. They'll salute him as if he was a general. But also look at the conflict between the three parties, the Lost Boys, the Pirates, and the First Nations people. Isn't Peter Pan more or less creating conflict between all three groups? Just so, and he finds this very entertaining. Isn't this a sign of antisocial personality disorder? Think about it. If you're constantly bored and you constantly need to create chaos, is this not a sign of a personality disorder? And also with the pirates, who wronged who first? Now, Peter Pan often boasts about cutting off Captain Hook's hand. So, who offended who first? And why would Captain Hook have any interest or care for Peter Pan? They're living in a forest in trees. They don't have any gold. Pirates seek after gold and wealth. These are a bunch of people wearing Halloween costumes living in the wilderness. But yet, Peter Pan cut off Captain Hook's hand. So who wronged who first? And who's really the victim here? But as the story unfolds, you see the conflict between all three parties. Peter Pan is manipulating all three parties. And at the end of the story, in many of these variations of the story, there's often a duel or a fight where Peter Pan challenges Captain Hook to a fight. Captain Hook has a sword where Peter Pan enters the fight with his knife. So he's bringing a knife to a sword fight. Is that not a form of grandiosity? Or perhaps a form of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Or a person's inability to judge future consequences. And do you see how often he, through his actions and his choices, those around him often fall into danger? How often, because of his own actions, his friends get captured and he goes and rescues them, even though... This conflict is, a, is of his own making. Is he not creating a form of Stockholm Syndrome where the people become dependent 
on the very people who are harming them. Think about it. Is this not a form of Stockholm Syndrome? So you got infantization, you have chaos among multiple groups, and now you have Stockholm Syndrome combined with a Dunning-Kruger effect, i.e. challenging a much larger opponent to a sword fight, but you bring a knife to a sword fight, and then you convince yourself you're the hero of the story. This is a grand example of narcissism in action. But also look at his relationship with the women around him. Do you see how he manipulates women who are natural caretakers or natural nurturers to look after him? He manipulates them so he doesn't have to grow up. So do you see the whole story? He finds vulnerable people. He manipulates them. He sets them up for failure, i.e. exposes them to danger. He creates drama and chaos with multiple groups. He then convinces himself he's the hero and not the villain. And then, through the narcissistic grooming process, whether it be infantization or narcissistic isolation, he has a, re a ready supply of narcissistic supply because he forces people to be dependent on him because he's constantly subjected them to chaos and confusion so, so they don't have time to think or develop their own lives. He also controls the narrative because they don't have time to think, they're too busy reacting to the danger that's around them. He can project his internal world or his internal thoughts on those around him and manipulate things to his advantage at everyone else's expense. Is this not a prime example or an exceptional example of narcissistic personality? disorder.